Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Angie, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Angie. I want to thank you all for having me here tonight, especially for young Dan here that's been my host and one of the things, one of the reasons, in fact, well, the main reason that I like to go out of town to talk is because I just love to be spoiled. I, I love the red carpet treatment. Anytime you want to bring me over here and stay at the Hilton, it's fine with me. <laughs> I, I never had it so good. I re- I'm really proud to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous that I have changed so much from the person that I was uh, back then, that today that I have integrity, that I walk with dignity, and everything that I ever wanted in my life, I have today. That's not to say, like, materially, except that somehow or another along the way, my loving and caring for you has filled up all the empty places that I thought you loving me would do. And the bonus is, is that I feel so loved and so cared for in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I have been a very, very, very needy person. And Georgia was right when she said that I am here because I have no other choice. I, I didn't have any other choice when I came back the last time. And I don't have any choice today. Because you see, I am a real alcoholic. And I never fit in anywhere. Uh, some of you may not know this, but I'm a Mexican. <laughs> and I was born and raised in a barrio. For those of you that don't know what a barrio is, it's a little Mexican community. A little slum area is really what it was. And in the days that I was raised there, we, d- we didn't have any Anglos there. And they weren't too anxious to come in there either. I was born into a family that wasn't ready for me then and isn't ready for me now. They are not really too impressed with what you've done with me. Uh, Because, you see, they always like to um, try to make me good. And now that you've made me good, they don't like the way I became good. I am uh, not of the earth type of person. I was born into this family a long time ago, really longer than you might think. I'm really a young person in an old container. (laughs) In case you didn't guess, I am uh, 52 years old. My story will not indicate that because I've had a long childhood. It has not, it has not, it's been, not been very happy, but it has been long. Uh, today, it's still that way. I was born into this family, and then I had an older sister that was perfect. You know the type I'm talking about. They always told her what to do, and she always did it, and she always did it right, and she screwed it up for me. Because I never knew how to be good. I never remembered to be good till after I was bad, and then I remembered I should have been good, and it's too late, and they used to, they used to hit me a lot. I, did, I was a better child. I didn't know I was a better child. I just thought that was part of the bargain of not knowing how to be good. If I'd have known I was a better child, you better believe I'd have held it against them people. <laughs> I also had a younger brother that happened to be a brother. And if you come from the family, this is all the way I perceived it. That's not to say that that's real. That's the way I perceived it. In the family that I was raised in, if you're a boy or the oldest girl, you got it made. But if you're the middle, uh, the did I say it right? The oldest girl or a boy, you got it made. But if you happen to be the second daughter, that's like one having one tit too many. <laughs> I know. recording this, right? I can say I can say all the four letter words I want. That's just 
so you'll know where I'm coming from. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean it up from here on out. I mean, they were divorced when I was seven, and they would send me to the nuns so they could teach me to be a lady. And what the nuns thought was a lady wasn't appealing to me then and isn't appealing to me now. Because, you know, I was also didn't only not know how to be good, but I, I didn't think of doing it, but as soon as you told me thou shalt not. I had an overwhelming desire to do it. It would get in my it would get in my head and I wouldn't rest until I did it. <laughs> Today I know it to be obsessions of the mind. What did I know? I'm just a little kid. I like to steal and I like to do everything that people told me not to do and then people used to like to dare me to do stuff because I would do anything for attention. I was so hungry to be loved, to be wanted, to be accepted. And as a child, I used to worship my mother, and I wanted her to love me so bad, like she seemed to love my sister and my brother. And no matter what I do, it did, it just was not enough for her. So when I went to the nuns there, then somebody dared me, and I raised the nun's skirt, see what she wore under all them clothes, and they 86 me from catechism. Now, uh, just a child, I ain't even had a drink yet. <laughs> but I'm one that believes that I always had the pilot lit. All I ever needed was a few. <laughs> I ran off to be with my daddy because I knew it was going to be better over there because my mother always said I was just like my father. And I knew what her opinion was of him. She didn't like him too well. <laughs> so I ran off to the San Fernando Valley, which was about 50, 60 miles from where I lived, to be with my daddy. I, what it was is I stole so much over here, I got caught so much, got whipped so much, it's time to go. And when I got over to the San Fernando Valley, when well, my daddy had taken up light housekeeping with a lady with eight kids, and all he wants is one more, right? Here comes trouble. Yeah, they didn't understand me there either. Uh, my dad used to take people up north to pick grapes and prunes, and, and we were fruit pickers, and God made two kinds of Mexicans, as fruit pickers and non-fruit pickers. And, and, I, and I'm not a fruit picker. They tried to make a fruit picker out of me, and it didn't take. <laughs> but we stayed beyond the season with the Gallo brothers. <laughs> I'll tell you what took. <laughs> they gave my dad a case of sherry wine, and somebody must have said, Thou shalt not. Because I had a big water glass of that sherry wine, and when it went down, it went down good. Everything felt good. It's just too bad something that good has to be wasted on social drinkers that don't appreciate it. <laughs> Isn't that a shame? I mean, I love this. I loved what it did for me. Man, every hair in my body stood on end. Anything going to make me feel that good, I want more. I always live for the thrills and the excitement. Anything that would make me feel that good, I want more. And you know, the, the, then there's the next day. Somehow or another, I always overshot the goal, trying to keep the goal. And that's a shame, because you see, I came too, and God knows how I felt. I had my hair stuck to my face where I threw up all over myself. And my clothes are torn where I got in a fight with somebody. And I didn't know what I'd done. I just knew that whatever I did, it was ugly. I had a sense of being dirty. I had a sense of shame that went all the way through me. The very first time I drank, I had them feelings of remorse the next day. I don't know what they are, you see. I just know that I feel less than. And it seems to me that I started a lifetime of looking at people's eyes, trying to figure out what I had done. Scared to know and scared not to know. And I always put up a front as a clown, you see, because I didn't know what to do with all those feelings. I was always so full of feelings. And I didn't know how to label them. And I, if I had known how to label them, I wouldn't have known what to do with them, you see. Alcohol for me was a medicine in order to fit in into that world out there where they were, that I didn't understand how them earth people live. Now, I'm just a child. When I start drinking, I drink every chance I can. I ran back to my mother's because I didn't fit in over at my dad's either, and she didn't want me back. And I was just a little girl. I was 13 years old, not quite 14, when she told me I couldn't come home. And I started running the streets and living here and there, wherever anybody would put up with me for a little while. And I remember I had a knot the size of my fist on my throat when I wanted my mother to put her arms around me and tell me that she loved me. But I couldn't, I couldn't reach out 
for that which I needed so desperately. I just said, I don't care, I don't give a damn, because I had to be tough, you see. And that's when the time that I started running around with, with the girls. You know, we call it a gang. It's just a, a bunch of uh, little girls that are scared. And we beat each other up, and we call it fun, because that's, that's what we do. And I had to be bad. You know I got to be bad, because I don't know how to be good. I also I was one of the original topless, bottomless dancers in the parties I went to. And uh, I don't even get paid for it. I don't even remember it. But you know, the girls always want to tell you what you did the next day. And so I don't know how to handle that. So I used to beat them up, and then they didn't tell me, because violence is the only way I ever handle anything that, that, that embarrassed me and that was uncomfortable. I also don't know how to work, because I'm a child. I quit school in the eighth grade, and, and, I, and I don't know how to work. And so I take up birth. It seemed like a good idea at the time. I really didn't do it because I'm a bad person. I just did it because it was fun. It really was a surprise to me when the state of California discovered me. They didn't understand that I was just having fun. They thought I was a bad person. They took me before a judge that asked me, well, young lady, what do you think we ought to do with you? Well, I don't know how to answer that. So I said, well, you're the judge. You ought to know. And I found out that that's not the right person to have that kind of an attitude with. <laughs> He sent me had to do a little bit of time for the state of California, and I don't know how to be good there either. Jesus, are they, they, because that's the first time they catch me, and they blame my mother, and my mother ain't talking to me because they blame her. So they sent me for nine months, and I don't know how to be good, and I do 13 months. Because I don't know how to be good, I, and i got to be bad there too, and you know they don't like for you to be bad in there. And uh, so I could see myself being the only gray-haired little old lady in that girl's <laughs> penitentiary. <laughs> When they finally let me out, I took my first inventory and I said, well, I don't have an education, I don't have a job, I don't have a home, I don't have any, any really much going for me. So I said, God, I better find me a husband. And you know, that always seemed to be a good, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I went out looking for a husband in places that husbands are not to be looked for. And uh, unfortunately for both of us, I found one. <laughs> He was a dreamer like me, too. He built them castles in the air, and I lived in them. And three months later, we were pregnant, and I was married in that order. That's before it was fashionable. That was when it was... I was born 20, 25 years before my time. I mean, they got pampers and birth control pills. At that time, it was taken away. Georgia knows what I'm talking about. And we were quite equipped for, for marriage, this man and I. He was a mainline heroin user. And uh, he doesn't like people talking that way about his wife. And so he doesn't want for me to drink. And I'm a good Mexican wife. I, I want to do everything he tells me. I just don't understand how he's trying to put the message across. And he introduces me to little white pills with crosses on them. I didn't know what they were, but I sure knew what they did to me. I had one eyeball over there and one over there, and I'd make baby clothes all night long. Put them, the same one, put them together. Chew the inside of my mouth, chew gum, drink coffee, smoke cigarettes, sing, scratch, and clean the house with a toothbrush. All at once. All at once. wasn't around much, but that was all right. I was having lots of fun with that Mexican music and uh, wa washing the Venetian blinds with a toothbrush <laughs> four o'clock in the morning. Well, as anybody that has added a little something to their booze knows, if once you take uppers, you got to take downers. And once you take downers and, uh, and uppers, you got to have something to level them suckers up. Because I just seemed to get used to everything really quick. So I, I became a great chemist. I mean, I was, I was good. And, and I also, I'm cunning, baffling, and powerful. I mean, I found out that the, that the weight control pills do the same to me as them bennies out in the street. And you know, once you get one doctor, I never asked too many questions of the doctors because I was afraid they wouldn't give me something. I just would tell them I can't sleep. Or, or I'm, um, I'm too groggy all the time, and I knew what they'd give me. So we always just called them whites. <laughs> Whatever they were. 
And it started out as exciting and it started out as a fountain of youth. And for 12 solid years, I was not to know what it was to have a sober day. And one day at a time, I went into literal hell. And that's not what I wanted from life. All I ever really wanted was somebody to love me, somebody to belong to me, you see, because I had felt that I never belonged to anybody and anybody belonged to me. By the time I had my baby, I realized this man didn't want to be married. And I figured out he didn't want to be married to me because he found out that thing about me that everybody found out sooner or later. So when they put that baby in my arms, my heart sank. I felt like finally, finally somebody belonged to me. That baby inspired feelings within me that nobody ever had before or since. You see, she was my baby and she belonged to me. And I would hold her by the hour and I would promise her that I would never beat her, discard her, and abandon her as I had been. And I meant it with every fiber of my being. But I was a child in a woman's body, and I didn't know how to, how to be a mother. I didn't even know how to be a woman. And you see, I could not keep any of my promises to that baby. I took that baby and her sister to places that children should not be taken because I am an alcoholic. Way down inside of me, there was always that little spark, that little hunger to be the woman that I am tonight, the woman that you have made of me, you see. But I thought that there was a monster that lived within me, and I could not be the way that other people look, and I wanted to so bad for my little girls. But you see, it strangled me because I didn't know how. I left their daddy after the second one was born because I figured out he did that, that I better go find me another husband because Jesus, I'm getting old and then nobody's going to have me. My mother said I was going to be like a rabbit and have a baby every year. My mother must have said some kind things along the way. I just never remember. I never chose to remember them. I always only accepted the rejection from anybody because I always looked for it and I always seemed to find it. I left that man and I, I went out. I didn't find another husband because it's really tough to find a husband because the ones that wanted me today, as I look back, the ones that wanted me, I, I didn't like because they were not challenging enough. Oh, but the ones that didn't want me. There was a certain type of man that I always fell in love with. And I've always been in love. And when I fall in love, I fall in love all over my body. Every inch of me falls in love forever. <laughs> the names of the men I've fallen in love with forever. The faces change. It's the feelings that stay the same. Trying to find somebody, somebody to take care of me. The right one. It's amazing how many right ones there are out there. You know the type I'm talking about. They got that shine in the eyes and all the girls think they're sexy. They got little t-shirts and, and tattoos all over their arms and, and say, what's happening, baby? Oh, love you. <laughs> I used to think it was charisma. Today I know it to be psychosis. <laughs> I know you girls identify with me. But aren't they a challenge? I mean, they were exciting. <laughs> I told you I live for thrills and excitement. This guy that I fell in love with and he was exciting was called CB. And that was his nickname and it stood for crazy bastard. I don't have to, I don't have to tell you any more than that. But you see, many a time I had to come home where there was not enough chemicals to kill what I had in that, that, uh, cold water shack, that when I would walk in and turn the lights on, there was mice in the filthy floor, and the sink would be black with cockroaches, and in that shack lived those two little girls, that the romance of being a mother had long since died, and the responsibility weighed heavy upon me. You see, I felt so guilty that I no longer wanted to be a mother. They were in my way, and they had the big eyes. They, they would not play out loud. They would fight in whispers. They would turn the television on without any sound and just see the, the little pictures there, you see, because they were afraid if they made any noise, I would come to. And when I would come to, before I was ready to come to, I would start screaming and yelling. And then I would start hitting them. And once I started hitting them, it seemed like a sheet would come down and I would lose all control. And I would hit them and hit them. And I wouldn't stop and I couldn't stop until there was blood bruises and battering and tears and yelling. 
And you know, this is the ugly side of our disease. This is the ugly side of my disease, what I did to them two little girls. Georgia and I were talking earlier, and the book says that we will not regret the past, no wish to shut the door on it. I will not shut the door on it, but I do regret what happened to my little girls as a result of my disease of alcoholism. No wonder I am so grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, where I have been able to let that go. And I'd like to interject in here that my oldest daughter is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she has been sober four years and ten months, and we can talk, and we are praying. But my youngest daughter is a heroin addict, heroin, heroin, and I don't know where she's at today. But I know that, that the last chapter is not written on her. But I know that my higher power also has not quit dealing with her because he found a way for me. I don't have to relive and regret with so much guilt and remorse what I did then. I just know that it took every minute and every inch for me to be here with you tonight and to tell you that I'm so grateful. I would not be alive if it was not for you. And even through all that, I didn't find Alcoholics Anonymous because even if I had been, it had been presented to me, I couldn't stand to live without anything. It was an answer for me. After five years of absolute self-will run riot, there is nothing else that I can call those five years because at this time I became an unprotected bar-drinking female, and everything that happens to unprotected women, female, uh, women alcoholics happened to me during that time. I know the feeling of degradation and self-loathing that the woman alcoholic goes through when she's unprotected. But I'll tell you that it's all right. We belong here, too. Uh, in fact, I had a hard time identifying with the toast burners. And I found out that them people, and it didn't, doesn't matter what the situation is, that the feelings about it was the same. Uh, he's, this man that was in the penitentiary, and he started writing letters and says, Babes, this time it's going to be different. And I believed him. You know, he, I mean, they don't lie. He says it's going to be different. So we made the Mexican Geographical. We moved 20 miles from Mama. And the only thing I can say, the only thing I can say about Mira Loma by Norco in Riverside County is it's in the middle of four wineries. Because I'm, I'm a wino. I like wine. And, uh, I think they call them winettes. I, I didn't feel, I felt more like a wino during that period than a winette. But I really tried. We really tried. I, today I know this man tried. At that time I thought it was just me trying because I even married him in the Catholic Church. And that's gone to any length for a Catholic, especially since he was a Methodist. That's how desperate I was to make it work. But, you know, it didn't take. He didn't, he didn't straighten up. And he started making the run to his connection. I started making the run to, my, to the wineries. And something happened to my drinking at that time. It changed where before I had been a party girl, now I became a bedroom drinker. It was no longer fun to go to the nightclubs and parties and them dances. I just wanted to drink by myself in my bedroom. Now is a time when I know what the words agony, despair, and utter loneliness. I know those words. I learned them in Alcoholics Anonymous, where I learned a definition of every feeling that I ever had. At that time, I used to lay in my bed in a fetal position and cry out and cry out in agony, in absolute agony. Now was the time when I would go to all the churches and be saved. I would study with this religion and that religion, and the conclusion I came to is that God just didn't listen to my prayers. Long ago, I had learned that he had and I did not listen to my prayers when I used to pray, God, bring my daddy home, and he didn't come back. I got the inkling that somehow God answered your prayers, but that he didn't listen to me. I had, I had drank so much and taken so much inside of me that nothing was working anymore, and it was a progression of my disease, and I didn't recognize it. And I couldn't stand the agony. I couldn't stand that madness inside of me. So what I thought is, I'm just going to kill myself. I was so tired. All I wanted to do was to die. I wasn't as scared of dying. I was as scared of living. I saved my sleeping pills, and I guess I took enough pills there to, to kill a horse, but I had a tolerance inside of me that nothing I took inside my, my, um, my mouth would have uh, killed me. And I slept for two days and two nights, and this man had been in bed with me both nights, and never once did he consider taking me to a doctor or to a hospital. 
When I came to, I came to on what has got to be the loneliest day of my life. When I couldn't drink and I couldn't be sober and I couldn't live and I God, I couldn't even die. And I sunk into a pit when I realized these men had been in bed with me and didn't care whether I lived or died. But you see, my higher power has always had his hand upon my life. And I didn't know it then. On that very day, there's a knock on the door of the lady from the PTA. If there's somebody I didn't want to see, is a lady from the PTA. <laughs> but in a moment of weakness, I let her in and I tell her my tale of woe. And you know I got a tale of woe about this SOB and how he done me wrong. <laughs> I never knew I could tell anybody anything about me. And she stayed with me, and she cleaned me up, and throughout the conversation, she asked me if I ever heard I al -Anon. I'd never heard I al -Anon, but I got the idea that if I went there, he would straighten up. So she cleaned me up, and she took me to al -Anon. And I'd like to say in defense of al -Anon, that this lady was a brand new al -Anonese. And I, I felt I didn't belong there. I knew I didn't belong there. I never belonged anywhere anyway. And I felt a little bit like a whorewood in a nunnery. There was absolutely no identification between me and them square broads. But, but, but they, put, they put their arm around me. They put their arm around me, and that's all I remember, is that, that they held hands and prayed. By this time, I'm having spiritual experiences, and I'm not going to go into detail. <laughs> but I had... I mean, I lived in a bedroom that it was naughty pine, and I took a lot of pills and drank a lot of wine. So you know that, and I had pictures of Jesus all over the wall. So you know I had a few spiritual experiences. <laughs> now, I, every so often, it's a hazy period at that time, and this lady takes me, and then one day I heard the word release. I went home and told him in detail how I was going to release him, and so he used to sleep with his clothes on and a knife under the pillow. And... Um, <laughs> And I'd sit in a corner and watch him. <laughs> if he'd be a doze enough, I'd go take a little peek at him and go, ah! I love that. <laughs> and he would say unkind things to me. He'd say, baby, I may have a monkey on my back, but you got an orangutan. <laughs> I thought, how dare he? I thought he was so bad he made me look good. I mean, I always had all these bruises and stuff. I like to go before his his mother. I said, look at what your son did to me. I never told her that I always jumped in first. <laughs> I always loved, but I always tried anyway. <laughs> One day I came home and he was gone and he took everything with him. He wasn't planning on coming back. And that's the way it had to be because though that life was unbearable, it was familiar. And fear has been the great compromiser of my life. And I'd have stayed there forever and, uh, until I'd have killed him or forced him to kill me. There's no two ways about it. Because I didn't know there was another way to go. And you see, at that time, that al lady took me to an AA meeting. And I'm thinking the al are trying to get rid of me. And I felt a little embarrassed about them finding me out. But I didn't have time because, you see, I walked into a young people's meeting in Pomona in August of 1964, and I sat in the back and listened to the sounds of Alcoholics Anonymous. I listened to that belly laughter, that smile that reaches the soul, that shine in the eyes, and that happy talk, and those are the sounds of Alcoholics Anonymous. The very first thing that attracted me to you was what was happening between you. I don't know what type of a meeting it was, whether it was a podium, whether it was a stable or what. I just know that there was something in that room that drew me, you see, because I had never heard it. Never heard what was happening in this room before, and I wanted it. God, I wanted how I felt at that night. I just thought it's too bad I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> if there's another name for the disease that you and I have, it's called I Ain't Got It. <laughs> Now, I knew I was weird. I knew I was different. I knew I was three steps ahead of the man with the butterfly nets. I just did. You see, alcohol had been an answer for me, and I remembered that. I did not think that Chapter 3 applied to me, but I remembered that I had wanted to always drink like I wasn't drinking there at the end. Because I remembered it used to do something for me, not all the time, just to me. Where I drank and I drank, and my body was drunk, and my mind was in agony. So when I came into this room, I often wondered 
What is it that happens when you and I come together? You know, something happens when you and I come together that has never happened any place else that I've ever been in. And he came to me one day, and I consider it a spiritual experience, but I realized that these are just empty rooms. That which happens in here, we bring it with us, every one of us. And it intermingles and becomes a group conscience. Call it whatever you want. But there is a dynamic something that happens when you and I come together. And if you're new like I was, you don't have it. Way down inside of me, there was always that spark. But I knew that I didn't have what you people had. And I wanted it. And it programmed out the only thing that I understood. I looked around at all them single, sober, good-looking young guys, and I said, man, I'm going to get me one of those. (laughs) And I did. It was the sickest one there. It had to be there. I got radar. (laughs) But I think that it takes what it takes, and that's what it took for me. Because for 10 months, I came around as a visitor. In Pomona, in those days, they used to go around the room, and everybody gave their name. And when it came to me, I'd say, I'm Angie, and I'm a visitor. (laughs) Nobody ever said, you don't belong here. Somehow you understood I've been kicked in the teeth by life and rejected by everybody I come in contact with and I couldn't have stood any more rejection. You put your arm around me and you said, keep coming back, keep coming back. Do you know what that feels like when you're used to people saying, keep on going, weirdo? (laughs) I knew, keep your mouth shut and smile a lot. (laughs) What a disappointment it was to me when I found out you were telling that to everybody. (laughs) No. I've always considered myself basically an honest person, especially if you don't know about it. And uh, so I stopped drinking and started doubled up on the meal towns and benzodrine and got weirder. And then this guy wanted to get rid of me, and I'm not easy to get rid of because I didn't have a backup. Everybody's got to have a backup. I was, I was never enough just for me. I had to have somebody. And so I moved to Pomona to be closer to the action, and I walked into a room one day. There's a cute little boy talking. He had big blue eyes and blonde hair. And he's saying he doesn't have a girlfriend, he doesn't have a surfboard, and he doesn't have a car. he just gotten out of the young boy's penitentiary over in Chino, and I think to myself, come here, little boy, I'll take care of you. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing like starting from scratch. <laughs> and I did. God, and I educated that young man on sick broads. I tell you, he didn't know what hit him. <laughs> but after that re- relationship was over, he decided to become a minister. And I'd, li- I'd like to think, I'd like to think that somehow in my small way, I helped push him over to God. <laughs> now, I don't like women, and I don't trust men that don't leave you much. (laughs) And it had been 12 years since I had had a sober day, and what I thought I was going through is called sobriety. What did I know about withdrawal? I never heard the word withdrawal. Why didn't you tell me there was such a thing? All I knew is you keep coming back and climb them 12 golden steps and live happily ever after. Now, that's all I ever wanted, was to live live happily ever after with a minimum of of, uh, effort on my part. <laughs> and you know, this young man taught me about the men in Alcoholics Anonymous. He was the first man that had ever been gentle with me. He was the first man that had ever been kind to me. And everywhere that he went, he wanted to take me with him. And he always seemed so proud to be seen with me. Me that had always been abused and misused by every man that I'd ever had. And I'd have hung- I hungered for that. I'd have stayed there forever with him, you see. Because Bill Wilson said in his writings that the good is the enemy of the best. And I was always willing to settle for some little corner of good. In my insecurity, I would grab and clutch, you see. I didn't know any other way. This is the way I came into you. I believe today that you, do not, you and I do not come together by accident. I believe that we come together by divine appointment. By divine appointment, you and I are here tonight. And that every relationship is its beginning and its parting. Every relationship has its beginning and its parting. But when you go on your way, you take a little bit of me with you, and you leave a little bit of you behind, and we're never the same because our lives have touched. That's a beautiful concept. And it isn't only a concept, it's a reality. I know it personally in my life today, but I didn't know it then. You see, then I clutched. 
he and I walked together for six and a half years. And we stayed sober for six months, and I turned my will and my life over to his care. He was gentle, sweet, young, and innocent. And after six months, when he got drunk, so did I. It was not my worst drunk, but it was my most hopeless one, because I felt I had tried Alcoholics Anonymous, and I knew it worked. It worked for you, but my case was different. And the reason that I'm here tonight is because my higher power has had mercy upon me and has given me the gift of sobriety. I came back to you when one of you named Carson went out and got me and brought me on a, back on a rainy Wednesday night. And the miracle for me is not that I've come to Alcoholics Anonymous because hundreds and hundreds of people come here and don't stay. The miracle for me is that I am still here. And that last December the 22nd, I celebrated my 20th birthday, which means that is a miracle. The miracle is for me, but the sobriety belongs to us. You see, it's ours. It's yours and mine, because this is what my higher power has done for me as a gift. And it belongs to you because you have taught me how to live. And I didn't know I was going to stay. I was, I am one of the desperate ones. And I was so scared that I couldn't be here. And I couldn't be there. And I didn't know where to turn to. And I came back and you put your arm around me and you said, we're glad you're back. Now I know when people are putting me on. I know where and I'm being patronized. But you had that kindness and you had that look in your eyes that I know that I have for you today, because we have the language of the heart in Alcoholics Anonymous, of one drunk talking to another. And when they put their arm around me and say, we're glad you're back, I knew you meant it. And in the beginning, it was a step up for me to be called an alcoholic from some of the stuff I'd been called. <laughs> and in the beginning, they, all, they were all so much better than I. They knew so much more. Then after a while, I knew more than some of you. And then I couldn't stand some of you. And the day came when I hated a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It is so sad, but the day comes if you happen to be like me. I am the type of person that I always got to have a bone to chew on. Because that's the only thing that will make me work this program, because I'm also lazy by nature. And it, I'll tell you, this guy, I hated everything about him. The way he walked, the way he breathed, the way he sat, the way, everything. And I know that because I watched him diligently. <laughs> I would walk into a room and I'd look around and I wouldn't be happy till I found it. Then he was, you know, your, your, your guts just twist. Now I hear things like, Resentments are the number one offender for the alcoholic. They're fatal. Scared the shit out of me. So I go to somebody who look like you know what you're talking about, and I ask you, how do you get over resentments? I put a smile on my face. I didn't want you to think I was a bad person. And you say, turn it over easy. Does it? This two shall pass. One day at a time. Go home with the two. Keep coming back and don't drink. <laughs> and I went home and did all that neat stuff, and when I came back, it still didn't work because I still hated him. And I didn't go back to you. I'd go to somebody else because I didn't want you to think I was a dummy. So I'd go to somebody else, and again, I'd say, ask, how do you get over resentments? And again, they'd say, turn it over. Is it doesn't this two shall pass one day at a time? Go home, read the book. Keep coming back and don't drink. After a while, I got the message. You don't know the answer either. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything else, folks. I just keep on keeping on and doing what's in front of me, and I just did it. <laughs> I just did it because you told me to do it, and I didn't know. But I knew that my best ideas got me to the place where I had no idea. And the day came when this man had a tragedy in his life. And as he was talking about it, after the meeting, everybody went out uh, and put their arms around him. And he, and I didn't want you to think I was so such a dud. So I went, and I put my arm around him, too, and gr grit your teeth and do it. And he put his head on my shoulder, and he started crying. And all that anger, all that resentment just melted away as it had never been there. And I learned the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. That you and I just keep coming back and keep on doing this stuff. And the day will come when we'll know what the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is. And I, that's when I began to be a member 
of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had always been outside that door looking in, and somehow I had been rocketed into a fourth dimension, into a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and my dedication began. It was incomplete because, you see, I had always lived in a cold, dark room without any structure, without any guidance, without anything and anybody to depend on, and it took me a long, long time to feel a part of you. I believe that today the essence of my life is my sobriety and the yearning of my heart under all my character defects is a longing to do whatever my higher power has spared me to do because I know he has spared me. I, I know that I have a lot of character defects because my sponsor assured me that if God removes all my character defects, I would disappear. <laughs> to God that everybody has a sponsor like I have. I mean, she knows how to get my attention. I, I'm not in too much danger of being very impressed with myself. I know that many of you come over and tell me, oh, you're wonderful. The only, I know because she told me that you're just saying, I'm so glad there's another weirdo around besides me. <laughs> That's what I know. And my sponsor, she says unkind things to me like, Angie, you don't have to sit in your own shit just because it's warm. And um, she'll say, maybe you're getting lonesome for the agony. When I call her up with, you know, with one hand holding my guts and, and cry, and she'll say, ask me a question, the question. Who's not doing it your way? Good. <laughs> I told you that I was a thief, and I was talking to Dan about this. You know, my sponsor ruined my, my stealing. The last, I, I'm a thief, and I don't steal. Isn't that crazy? I just like I'm an alcoholic and don't drink. Uh, I used to like to take ashtrays as souvenirs whenever I'd go speak someplace. I'd take an ashtray. Now I smoke a pack of cigarettes a week, so you, it's the only thing I do as a so any thing that I do socially is, is uh, smoking. And uh, she says, when she found out about it, I'm not telling her because I don't think it's stealing. I mean, if I'm doing it, I don't think it's stealing. And she asked me, and I told her about this, and she says, well, you know, for you, that's stealing. I says, it's not stealing, it's just taking souvenirs. And she says, I don't know about you, but my integrity is worth more than an ashtray. And she ruined it for me. <laughs> yeah, I could never take another ashtray again. I'll be damned if <laughs> her integrity is going to be worth more than mine. <laughs> I didn't have a sponsor in the beginning because I still don't like them broads even if they're them older ones I didn't like the way they looked at me they knew I knew what they I didn't know what they knew but I knew they knew so I'd stay away from them and them younger ones I have to protect that young guy from and so I, the, the men were always a lot kinder and so I stuck around with them and um uh, this young man and I got married, and I always had a fear way down inside of me that he would leave. And the day came when he did leave. The day came when all my chickens came to roost because my higher power said, it's time, it's time. And my, my daughter started going the same route that I had been, and I prayed God spare my babies, and he didn't spare my babies. I had a terrible depression. Again, I contemplated an attempt at suicide at five years, five and a half years sober. That young man went and took me to the psych ward, went home, packed his clothes, and left me. And everything that I ever feared came about. And the reason that I stand before you tonight is because my higher power has deemed it so. I didn't want to be alive. I felt totally betrayed by this man. And I got on my knees and I said, okay, God, I'm never going to be happy again. All you ever want me to do is work with a sick woman drunk let them puke on me, all right? <laughs> And it, it, it was at this time that from the women came around me, and it is from the women that I've learned to be a woman. I was finally able to share the secrets of my heart, and you shared the secrets of your heart with me. And I knew we were not so different. And it is from the men in Alcoholics Anonymous that have treated me like a lady that I've learned to be a lady. And I went to one of you named Dave, and I said, Dave, what's wrong with me that I can't seem to have a relationship, not, not even with a beautiful man like this one? And he held me close and said, you're a beautiful, warm, loving lady. And one day you will know the reason. And I went home and got on my knees. And that's when I turned my will and my life over to the care of God by, say, by saying, screw them all. Let them do what they goddamn please. I'm tired. I really used the F word. But I got I to gotta clean, clean it up here. You to think bad things about me. And I don't know 
what you're hired for, but mine has a weird sense of humor. When I want something so bad, ten our fathers, ten Hail Marys, it don't come as soon as you say, oh, screw it, here it comes. <laughs> now, I'm not here to tell you that young man came back because he went on to another life. But when I got to the other side, when I got to the other side, beyond the part where I wanted to kill him and put booze in his coffee, she'd blow him away with a shotgun in the gut. When I got on the, over on the other side of that, I touched the power. I touched the strength within me. And I knew that nothing and nobody would ever own me again. Because, because after all that said and done, they never had it to give. That which I demanded of them, they didn't have it to give. The only one that ever has those filling up, that can ever fill up them empty places, is the, the relationship that I hold with my higher power today. After all that's said and done, when my guts are hanging out, it's only you and me, God, anyway. It's only you and me. Only I can work my program. You can do it for me. You can walk with me. You can listen to me. You can hold me close. But you see, that, that emptiness inside of me can only be filled up with my relationship with my higher power. And my children came back one at a time. I don't even want them back anymore, and they came back. They were, they went to work, and I went to school, and I became self-supporting through my own contributions. I threw myself completely and absolutely into this program without any reservation. And that is the reason that I walk tall with dignity and self-respect, that I have integrity today. Because of that, you see. I, now, I kept falling in love throughout all this time. And so one day at a time, I don't get married. One day at a time, I don't steal. And one day at a time, I don't drink. And uh, I'll tell my higher power heard this. Now, I don't want to have them teenage, 16-year-old feelings anymore. I used to like them, but they're, now they just begin. The older, I don't know whether it's that I'm, that I'm long sober or is I'm getting old. But, you know, it's just a pain in the rear to feel 16 years old when you're 45. And my higher power heard this. And I met a man. I, a 13 step a man is what it amounts to. And some things happened before that, though. I lived almost 10 years single. I am one of those ladies that has heard, that had to learn to, to live by myself to find out the difference between being lonely or having solitude. I learned to like to be alone. I liked working and spending my own money any way I wanted, go wherever I wanted, get married any weekend I wanted, you know, all the, with whomever I wanted. You know, that type of stuff was really nifty. I said, is this what I was always fighting about? When I was, uh, it was about 10 years ago, I found out what it was to have another crisis in my life. That sister that had always been held up as an example for me chose to take her life, and it was my destiny to be the one to find her, and I could not believe what was before my eyes. Newcomer, I don't come to give you anything, to teach you anything. I come to share my life with you, because I believe that I have a gift of communication, that I'm supposed to be here to share my life with you, because I am God's melody of life, and he sings his song. That's why I'm here. If I could have saved anybody, it would have been my sister. But because his hand is always light, Whenever it is heavy. Two weeks after my sister killed herself, I became a grandma. Now, I've been a total failure as a mother, but I'm good as a grandma. I mean, I can, I can hold myself up to any grandma. They, they think grandma and Santa Claus are synonymous. They came to visit me once, and we ran out of milk, so I went and made some powdered milk. And the older one, well, little eyes got real big, and she said, Mama, Mama, look, Grandma made milk out of water. Huh? Ah, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I talked in Arizona about three years ago in Sedona, and I took that oldest one with me, and I had a long white blouse that covers a multitude of recent sin, and long white pants, and this little girl looked up at me with them shiny little eyes and said, Grandma, you look just like the white angel. You see, she saw what you have made of me. She's never had to see her grandma 
crawling around in her own vomit, her grandma looking like a monster from having been battered. She has not seen her grandmother batter her like her, her mother had to, you see. All she has seen is what she's done with me. See, this little angel little thing. Huh? That's what you've done with me. I'll tell you what else you've done with me. I have a man in my life, my present husband. <laughs> hardly ever give my last name because you know some of us are multi-marriers and we're so, so, but there is this man who did a 13th step in my life today that I have been married to him five and a half years and yeah I never was that's like 25 for anybody else because <laughs> I, I never was married to anybody that long I mean I've had several but there's, there's none of them was, uh, two of them I married twice Oh, and I had, I committed bigamy sober verse. No big deal. <laughs> Didn't get caught in it. <laughs> and you know something? He tells me, when I left Blythe, a couple, Blythe, you know what Blythe is. Some of us will go to any length to be married. It's in, just, just before the earth falls into nothing. When I left there, he had, he put his arm around me and told me that he loved me. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to him. I tell him that all the time. And, and he, he's convinced of it. He tells me I'm the greatest. Left, he over here tells me he's one in a hundred thousand. And he is. He is a good man. And he never had it so good. I love him. He tells me he loves me from scratch. I don't have to chase him around the house asking him even. He tells me I'm the greatest cook there is. I'm over there cooking. He says I'm the greatest house cleaner. I'm just scrubbing. He says his shirts never look so good. Come over there. He never had it so good. And neither have I because you see, I love him. But he doesn't own me. There is a core of me. And there is a part of me that belongs to you. That belongs to Alcoholics Anonymous. To my higher power that has used Alcoholics Anonymous as a vehicle to give me whatever I was meant to get from him. They used to read a lot of things to me, and I would read a lot of things in Alcoholics Anonymous. And when it came to the promises, it said, we will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. And I would sob whenever I would read that. You see, I had always longed. You know what it's like to have so much in you that nothing kills that madness? You could only stop, you could only stop that head from going. To tell you that I have serenity, and I have peace daily. Daily. Not because somebody read it to me, not because I read it, but because I have experienced it. I have a gift from my higher power. He has touched me. I could never have done it on my own. May he do the same for you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.